Ice your cream by any means and being with self esteem. Beauty supreme and booty walk so mean. The way you fit in them jeans, you eat your cornbread and greens. Dance or a doctor, red wine or vodka. Redesign your spot and redefine your mantra. Retwist your locks and realign your chakras. Doing your squats and getting closer to God, huh? Brunching with your squad or taking a girl's trip. Adjust your crown, you guys give to the world, sis. Celestial body, drink your water. Meditate, sun kiss goddess, heavenly order. Levitate, tribe of Ashanti. Black girl magic, melanin popping. Whether you ratchet or lavish, whether you bougie or savage, you a gift and a treasure. You got to love a black girl getting a shift together. Black girls are getting a shift together. These black girls getting a shift together, man. These black girls are getting a shift together. These black girls getting a shift together, dog. God made you, boo, you know he showed out. Mahogany enchantress, blessings overflow now. Picture of success, seductive silhouettes on a spiritual quest. Manifest and be blessed. Mother, sister, auntie, tribe of Ashanti. Rocking your locks, I got a close crop blondie. The curse and the gift uplift, apply pressure. Nothing like a black girl getting a shift together. Nothing like a black girl getting a shift together. Nothing like a black girl getting a shift together. Black girls are getting a shift together. Black girls are getting a shift together, man. Man, these black girls are getting they shift together, man. These black girls are getting they shift together. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Black Girls Getting Their Shift Together. This is a podcast about mental health and wellness that supports our community. And I promise to deliver relevant topics each week just so we can be in the know. It's all about growing. So we are coming to an end of season three. I have three more episodes and then I'm going on a brief hiatus and then I'm taking a month of December starting January 2022 with an upgrade on everything. So you'll have to definitely come back and check it out. So if you're listening on the audio podcast, please Give your girl a five-star review. I would so much appreciate it. As well as all my YouTube listeners, make sure you like, subscribe, and share. I would greatly, greatly, greatly appreciate it. All right. Um, And I vow that each week I was going to give a shout out to some of my audio listeners because, again, you know, we're global over here in the honeycomb. So let me see. I looked it up. I would love to give a shout out to the listeners in Rwanda. I don't know who you are, but I appreciate all your support. Now we're going to get right into it. I'm going to bring my beautiful, motivating guest out of the waiting room and bring her on deck and introduce you all to the lovely Dr. Tamika. What's up, Ursula? How are you, Dr. Tamika? I'm well. I'm well. You're looking quite beautiful as usual. Thank you. And you are too. I mean, I'm just admiring the greenery behind you. I love that. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. Thank you. Yes, yes. All their brothers and sisters are over there. There's about six more over there. <laughs> you know, that's that's you know, I'm a talented woman, but that's one thing that I am not talented at. I do not have a green thumb, so. I love plants, but I just, I'm not good with them. And so I admire whenever I see somebody that has beautiful plants, I just admire that. Oh, wow. Thank you. You know, I never was like that either, Mm. but over quarantine, Mm. I said, you know what? 
I'm going to start a new hobby that I can cultivate on wow. my own and watch literally the fruits of my labor. Yes. So I have some house plants that I would keep outside, vice versa. But I also started growing my food. Very nice. Yeah. Oh my gosh. So, um, you know, I have. I wish I had a huge backyard, but I work with what I had. So I had yeah. a lot of container gardens. So I was growing herbs and strawberries. Ooh, nice. Yeah. Oh, and peppers. Wonderful. Yeah. So ultimately, I would love to just live off the land, live and eat That's the food. Right. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Gosh, I wish I had that skill. Just try out a little spider plant. I found out that those are very hard to kill. Like, wait, right here. This one. You, you know what? If I had a moment, I would run into the kitchen and grab this plant. Uh, one of my friend's daughters, she was doing these little gift baskets of mint. So she had some surplus of mint and she was giving it out. Honey, my mint is a hot mess right now. Oh, it's a hot it? mess. It's a hot mess. And then, I mean, to make it so bad, also to my cats started eating it. I didn't know they could eat mint. They they have been chewing on it. So huh. yeah, yeah, yeah. So the fact that I most of the time forget to water it, I forgot, you know, <clears throat> it's just it's just bad or it's bad or slow. <laughs> it's bad. Don't worry, you can water our souls and our motivation Ooh. tonight. How about yes, that? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> so I would love to read your bio, just a little little snackable size portions of it. Um, first, before I do that, we have a good day to you all. This is from Blind Guy, His Wife and Their Life. Nice. All right. Um, let's see. So as you know, we all are talking to Dr. Tamika Ellington. She is the CEO and founder of the First Generation Revolutionaries, which is a movement developed to provide professional development networking and spiritual fulfillment i love yes, that to yes. her clients she is a motivational speaker and she is international acclaimed and awarded educator and scholar professional development strategist and first generation student advocate and you know what this sister has accomplished so much this is just a little <laughs> bit of what she i'd be here all night reading it but um I just first want to tell you all the motivation for me um, reaching out to Dr. Tamika. So about a month and a half ago, we have a mutual uh, friend, Gunterman, mm -hmm. and you can look him up on Instagram. Oh, I'll be on his show tomorrow night at 730. Yes, you will. I saw that. Yes, yes. Yes. And so I saw Dr. Tamika. Uh, she was being interviewed. I'd never seen her before. But when she was talking, I literally felt fire going through mm. my spine. Mm. She was so motivating. And you know, your girl had to slide up in that DM before she was finished with her own interview. Mm. I was mm. like, I get to me. Oh, man, you should have <laughs> seen me. I was like, I got up in that DM. And I tell you, I was so ecstatic when you said yes, because it seems like you have a lot going on. So I am very honored that you took time out tonight to come on to my show. Absolutely. It's my honor. It's my honor. Thank you. Did I leave anything? I know I did, but do you want to tell us a little more about yourself? You know, where you grew up, how you grew up, what did it look like? Yeah. So I'm actually a Cleveland native. Um, I grew up um, in the inner city of Cleveland uh, to a single mom. I have a brother and a sister. So my mom had me when she was 16, brother 17, and then my sister when she was 20. And I grew up without my dad. My dad was unfortunately absent because um, he was struggling with drug abuse and alcoholism and eventually, you know, landed him in jail for about 15 years. And so mm -hmm. I've, you know, taken this, this step, this journey that I've been on because I've always wanted something different in my life. Mm -hmm. You know, um, what I saw around me was something that I didn't want. I didn't want to, you know, have to um, not have food. You know, I didn't mm -hmm. want to have to deal with the violence. You know, there was lots of violence and drugs and things around me. And I, I just wanted peace. Like as, as a young person, I craved peace of mind. 
even and as a child, you even felt as that. a child, yes, even as mm. a child, I craved peace of mind. And so my the whole journey that I've been on has been to develop myself and have peace of mind. So you already start, and I already feel mm, that. Mm. I already feel it in my spine. It sparked. <laughs> it just sparked. <laughs> Wow. So how long, how young did you feel that, have that, that Oh my journey? gosh. You know, I think I would say maybe like in like maybe fifth or sixth grade, because I was the kind of kid I love to read. So um, I didn't really go outside a whole lot because I would either be in the house reading or I'm an artist. And so I would be in the house drawing or painting or doing something. And I always loved being in a peaceful place. And so outside was fun, but when I was inside and able to just sit and paint or sit and read, I mean, that's when I was at my, my happiest, you know? Mm. Yeah. When I was at my happiest. Yeah, absolutely. And um, unfortunately, I really knew that me going to college. So like when I went to college for undergrad, it wasn't just for me to get a job or for me to get a degree, but what it was for really was a lot of, I needed peace. There was a lot of um, uns unsettling in my household, you know, and college gave me the space to be at peace. You have triggered me. That's mm -hmm. exactly how I felt. It yep. Transparent moment. It wasn't even about the education at the time. Yep. Like, I got to get out. I got to get out of here. Yep. Absolutely. I got to get out of here. Mm -hmm. And, wow. you know, it's, it's interesting because when I left, like I said, I have a brother and a sister. I'm the oldest. And when I left to go to college, I was I was beaten down the door to leave. But when I finally got there, I remember the first day that I was on campus. I, I think I cried the entire day because Why? I was feeling I was feeling guilty about leaving my brother and my sister. Oh, mm -hmm. wow. Mm -hmm. Really? Yeah. And I carried that guilt for a long time. And, you know, finally, I had a chance to talk to my sister about it. And she said, Tamika, you had to leave. You know, you had you had to go. But, you know, it's like if I could have put my brother and my sister and my suitcase with me, I would have took them too. you know. So it was it was difficult. It was a it was something I had to do. I needed that peace. But um, that guilt, you know, I carried that guilt because I couldn't take them with me. Wow. Well, mm -hmm. you know, that's the ultimate uh, act of self-care. Mm, wow. Right? Yeah. Yeah, wow. absolutely. So you've always been strong. That in a good way, not that toxic strong with the super <laughs> black superwoman toxic strong. Like, no, I didn't mean it like that, but you followed, you did what you had to do. Yes. Man. Yes. Yeah. Did they ever want to come and see you or they just knew Right. My sister did. My sister would come up for like little sibs weekend and things like that. So, you know, she would come and visit me. Um, my brother, you know, that wasn't really his thing, but my sister yeah. loved coming to visit. Yeah. Really? How far yeah. did you go away to college? Not to very home? far. Yeah, not very far. I just went about an hour away from home. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. That's yeah. why she could visit. Uh-huh. Yeah. Look, yeah. I I moved 18 hours away. <laughs> wow. You know what? I almost I almost moved about maybe 10 hours away because um, my background is in fashion design. So I'm a fashion designer by trade. Mm -hmm. And um, Kent State University School of Fashion is one of the top schools in the nation. So I went there as an undergrad and eventually ended up becoming a, a professor there. Um, I was actually the first black professor ever at the School of Fashion. And, um, you know, being able to be uh, in that space at one of the top schools was the, the thing that was I was looking for. But right. I almost moved to Savannah, Georgia. I love Savannah. Uh, Savannah College of um, Art and Design. They yes. also have a great fashion program, too. And I almost went to that school. But, you know, I was too scared. I wasn't as brave as you at that age. I was I was too afraid to move away. And plus, like I said, too, I already felt guilt about leaving my brother yeah. and my sister, you know, so I needed to be able to get back to them, you know, if I had to. Right. So, right. Mm -hmm. I understand that. See, yeah. I didn't have siblings. Mm, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. But I had a parent who I absolutely loved and adored. But I get it. I yes. get it. Um, 
even an hour away, even being down the street, being outside of that, uh, mm -hmm. those four walls, that's still courageous. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank for you. sure. So before we get into the, the meat of it, can you tell us how you came about being the first African-American professor of fashion? Oh, wow, it was, it's been a journey. I mean, it really has. Um, after I finished school, uh, got my degree in fashion design. I ended up going into the industry. And so I actually worked as a fashion designer for several years uh, before, you know, I, I discovered that teaching was my calling. You know, I thought I was going to be a fashion designer for the rest of my life. And excuse me. So wait, so was that when Amber Crombie and Fitch was incorporated? Yeah. Or yes. Before? Yeah, that, yeah, that's when I was working. I was working as a designer for Abercrombie and Fitch. Now, why couldn't they make some jeans for some sisters with a small waist, <laughs> big butt, and wide hips? Like we were not that us. we aren't their clientele, honey. We're not oh. their clientele. And it's funny oh. because when I first started working there, they had just finished with a lawsuit, a discriminat a discrimination lawsuit, because they hired these uh, the store associates that they hired were um, you had to have a certain look in order which, to work there, which was. <laughs> okay, got was, it. <laughs> right, it was slender, beautiful, flawless, and white. You know, mm. yeah, yeah. But you know, eventually they learned their lesson and they diversified. But I mean, that's what they were—that's their customer, and so they wanted their sales associates to look like their customer. I mean, it was amazing branding. I mean, they were amazing at marketing and branding, absolutely. But it was also very discriminatory. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I worked um, in the fashion industry for several years. And while I was actually at Abercrombie, um, I loved what I was doing. Um, I was what is called a technical designer. So a technical designer is almost kind of like a, a engineer. They're the people that create all of the patterns. They, they take the idea and then they make it a reality. So one of the things that I had to do was to give specifications for how many stitches should be in certain areas of the garment. So the sleeve, like how many stitches should be in the sleeve? And if I was going to do a buttonhole, how many stitches needed to be in the buttonhole? You know, I mean, it was very, very detailed, like clothing, um, you know, clothing design, good quality clothing design. There's a lot of technical aspects to it. And so that's the that's the kind of work that I was doing. I was making sure that, you know, Abercrombie's, you know, product was going to come out and it was going to be quality and it was going to last. That's one thing I, that I loved about them is that they always make quality product. You know, they, they don't make cheap stuff, you know, not like rainbow. <laughs> like my sundress is right. from rainbow. <laughs> <laughs> you wash it twice and it's gone. They could literally be shreds of fire. Now oh listen, I've had yes. a couple of nice um sundresses from rainbow. No. <laughs> <laughs> and so while I was there, like while I was at Abercrombie, I'm making all this cool product, but I wasn't happy. Um I started understanding that I was I was talented at what I was doing. I was doing a good job. They were about to get ready to promote me. And then I just said, you know what? It's time for me to leave. I have to go because I'm not happy. I felt like there, there was something more for me. And I felt like I wasn't adding anything to the universe. I was making all this cool product and I was loving what I was doing, but what was I adding to the universe? So, Okay. Did you feel like you had a, well, first of all, we have a hello. Hi, reparations. She said, hey, Ursula, hey. Dr. Tamika, mods hey. in chat, hope all is well. Yeah, I met her. I, I, I like her too, reparations. Yes. And she's already <laughs> dropping, dropping some light bubble emojis and blind guy and his wife and their life said the desire to give back is powerful when you have siblings. Yeah. I grew up with eight. Wow. Wow. Five wow. sisters and three brothers. Wow. So I have a lot of nieces and nephews too. Wow. That's a yeah. lot. That's a big, big family. family. Yeah, it is a big family. Yeah, Ooh. absolutely. And but did you ever feel conflicted? You know, you're, you're making a great salary and you love what you're doing, but yep. did you feel like the passion and purpose, it didn't intersect or was it just you know, missing the mark. It was, I was definitely conflicted because in the fashion industry, there's room to make a really good living. Um, and so 
when I decided that I wanted to leave to start teaching, a, a, like my friends who were still working in the fashion industry, they were like, are you crazy? Like, are you going to, are you crazy? You're going to leave this job. You're going to start teaching because teachers make a lot less, you know, than designers in the fashion industry. They were like, you're not going to be making any money. And, you know, and that was one of my goals because I grew up in poverty. I was like, I don't want to be back in poverty. You know, and so I had to really make up my mind, okay, is it going to be me staying here just because I want to make a lot of money? Or is it going to be, you know, me going over here and doing what it is I feel like my soul is being called to do so that I can be joyous, you know, and have joy. And I chose joy. Oh, yeah, I chose I chose joy, honey. Yes, Yes. ma'am. Yes. Well, how long did it take for you to say, you know, I'm ready to leave? And then fast forward to here's my two weeks. Mm. Or you can give two weeks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I knew that I, that I would say by like maybe eight months of being there, I was like, yeah, this isn't really this isn't it for me. And so Did I stayed there for a year. Um, and after that year, I was gone. Were you yeah. miserable in that year because you, you know knew what? something was nagging? Well, like I said, I loved what I was doing. You know, I loved making the product. I loved being a designer. I had great teammates that I was working with. I loved all my colleagues. You know, I mean, it was a fun job. And and I'm telling you, the music that Abercrombie plays in the store is the same music that they play in the design studios. I mean, so you at work and you like, boom, 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 boom. At, I mean, at work, you know? And so it was fun to be there. I loved being there. But <laughs> my hips wouldn't allow me to shout. So I don't know the music. See? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So you walk into an Abercrombie. They, honey, they got the cologne. They spray in the cologne. They spray in the perfume. And it's the whole ambiance. You know, like I said, yeah. I mean, Abercrombie is amazing at their branding and their marketing. And so the, the home office, like where the design studios were, I mean, it's pretty much like the same kind of ambiance. You know, wow. um, and so it was a lot of young people working there, you know, all, you know, fresh out of college. And we had fun. We had a lot of fun. I mean, we would go out to parties and stuff like that. I mean, it was a lot of fun working there. But again, like my soul was calling me to do something else. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So let's get into the meat of it. Yeah. Tonight's topic, how to face your fears. Yes. So for any of the listeners that are just tuning in, Dr. Tamika, she had an extremely well-established career at Abercrombie and Fitch, and she had this uh, calling, her, her passion and purpose to teach. So we want to know, how did you face your fears when you said, okay, you did your year and you said, okay, that's it. Yeah. What was the yeah. first thought process? Yeah. You, you know, the, trigger. I, the, the first thought process is just, I needed to be joyous. I needed to be at peace and I loved, you know, fashion. And so I ended up um, applying for a job at um, Kent State and I started working there part-time. Um, and while I was working there part-time, I was also getting my PhD. So I was working on my PhD and teaching part-time and that worked out great. And then once I got finished with all of my coursework, um, I was what, uh, academia calls ABD. That's all but dissertation, A, B, D. Oh. So, yeah, so I was ABD. I was all but dissertation. And by that time I was ready to start working full-time in the school of fashion and, I applied for several jobs there. Um, the first job I got denied. The second time that I applied, I got denied. And I started noticing a pattern. Um, since I was working there part time, I saw the people that they had chosen instead of choosing me. And there was this pattern. I mean, everybody was a white woman who had ended up having actually like less education than me. And so around the third time that happened, I noticed I was like, OK, so I'm getting I'm, I, I'm con, you know, consistently getting passed up. So the third time came around and I got passed up once again. How did that make you feel? I was devastated. I was devastated because, first off, I'm a product of fashion at Kent State University. So they trained me so they know what my skills are, first mm -hmm. of all. And then I had, you know, such an emotionally, you know, connected uh, I was already, you know, emotionally connected to the students. You know, I loved what it was I was doing. I finally found like, okay, this is my calling. This is what I'm supposed to be doing. And these people are telling me, no, 
you know, this is not what you're supposed to do. Mm. And so um, after that third time, I went to one of my mentors crying my eyeballs out. Like, you know, I don't know what's going on. Something is something is not right. You know, mm-hmm. this is my third time getting passed up. And at one point I had got passed up for someone who only had a bachelor's degree. Mm. Yeah. And so I was like, something's not right here. And so my mentor, um, she took me over to the affirmative action department and I ended up having to file an affirmative action uh, complaint against the fashion school. And Did so you really, I didn't yes, know that. Yes. I, so, I missed that part of the interview. Yes. With Gerson, yeah. And what? so that's, that's how I, you know, got the job and that job that I was applying for, that was not even a professor's job. That was just a instructor's job. So a professor is a higher level ranking, um, you know, and, you know, educator than an instructor. Mm. Right. So I couldn't even get an instructor's job. Right. Mm. And so after I finished up my PhD, by this time, once I'm done with my PhD, I'm the only designer in the whole department that has a PhD. Okay. And I'm the only one that has a PhD. All the other designers in the department have a master's of fine arts because that's the that's also considered a terminal degree or the like the one of the highest degrees that you can get, you know, to teach in fashion. Um, and so I was the only one who had a PhD. And um, I went to my department chair and I said, you know, this school has never had a black professor. And I said, I'm qualified and I think it's time that Kent State University has a black professor. Mm-hmm. And and the and the director, I mean, he was on board with it, but you know, my colleagues were ve- not very happy at all about it, you know. And so I stepped into my professorship in a space where I wasn't wanted. Ouch. Yeah, yeah, and that was quite difficult. Um, the first two years while I was working as a professor that's the 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 first couple of years is called tenure track Uh, tenure track lasts for about five or six years and then you get promoted to associate professor so as an assistant professor you have to you know do publications and do all this other research and all the work that you do will then equal up to you getting your tenure and promotion right the first two years you know while i was working towards tenure and promotion was absolutely miserable because oh, I would go no. to work, I would go to work, and the the stress would all. I mean, just I mean, just as soon as I walked through the door, the stress would just overtake me. You know, yeah. it would overtake my body, and I started having this terrible imposter syndrome. Like, well, maybe you know, my they said that I'm not talented enough to be here. Maybe I'm really not talented enough to be here. Mm-hmm. You know, and so I let all of that stuff get in my head. You know, for the first two years, and I was I was basically like living life like I had to prove myself to these people and mm. I felt like on um, pins and needles because I'm like they're waiting for me to mess up so that they can say well see I told you she didn't belong here you know and so I I had to figure out a way to get over that and really that whole two years of imposter syndrome imposter syndrome imposter syndrome is just something that's just it's a feeling that we have that's wrapped up in fear right Exactly. It's, it's wrapped and wrapped in fear. Ooh. Right. And so eventually, you know, I started doing a lot of meditating and praying and things. Mm-hmm. And God just spoke to me and said, why do you care so much about what these people have to say about you? I put you here as the first black professor. You're talented enough to be here. You do what it is I need you to do. And after I'm telling you, after that two years and I had the realization of, I don't have to care what these people think. And Ooh. once I once I stopped caring, Ursula, I was on fire. I became the top researcher in that department. Did you I, really? Oh, absolutely. Still, and they hate that I left, okay? <laughs> you said they, still. <laughs> they hate that I left, okay? And so, I traveled, I was able to travel around the world. I mean, I've been all over the place, you know, doing my research, you know, uh, you know I, I'm, since I'm a designer, um, I do a lot of exhibition work and things like that, too. And so, I mean, I've gone to China, I've gone to Korea, I've gone to Florence, I've gone to a lot of different places, you know, talking about my research. And so, so how did your excuse me, how did your yeah. sim, how do your siblings at that time, how did they feel about your success? Well, you know what, that's a complicated question. It really is. It is. I mean, um, 
and we can get to that a little bit later. But we'll that's yeah, we'll yeah, we'll get to that a little bit later. But that's that's it's kind of complicated right now. But so. um, yeah, but it was it was amazing once I finally stepped out of that imposter syndrome and I let the fire take me. Then I mean, like I said, I was I was I was on top of it, and I'm still, even though I'm not even there. I mean, the the work that I've been doing is still top tier and bringing a lot of, of notoriety to Kent State. So, wow. Yeah, yes, 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 yes. So is this, well, we'll talk about the textures. Yes. I wanted to segue into that, yes. but I still want to know, um, was there anything else in, with the meditation and the prayer that ignited that fire to put the fear aside or in the imposter syndrome it was it was it was i'm telling you it was all god it was all it was all god because i'm telling you every single time like every paper i would write every design piece that i would do i would always pray god give me the words god mm. give me god give me the creativity that i need to be able to do this give me the skill that i need so i'm telling you the whole time like after i got that fire every single time that i did something paper I was going to be publishing or a book I was going to be writing or whatever the case might be, I will always say, God, just give me the words. Wow. Just, just give me the creativity that I need to be able to do this. You know, it, it reminds me um, when someone is not connected to themselves mm -hmm. that, and I'm speaking from experience, another transparent moment that we look for the external validation absolutely but when we are connected absolutely. to ourself god don't matter exactly. the external the external don't matter because everything i'm doing is for the glory it's for the glory and i'm a representation of that glory and so i better come with it i better yeah. come with it because i'm a representation of that glory and, and so you did yes absolutely <laughs> May I read yes. a comment? Um, yes, yes. She does see blind guy and his wife said, yes, ma'am. Confuse that imposter syndrome and make them hate that you left. Mm -hmm. I wish these, I wish these folks would make me feel under. Oh, I know that's right. <laughs> I wish these folks would make me feel under deserving. Mm -hmm. That part. Yes, yes, yes. Man, so okay. Do you feel the, the more connected that you are to yourself, that sometimes you just get these funnel dumps of creativity that into yeah, you yes, get yeah. You know, it's it's actually it's called flow. Um, and there's something that um that I'm trying my best because you know, things when 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 your mind is just um when you're unfocused, it's hard to be in the flow. And so I have this piece of paper that I keep on my desk and I, I look at it all the time and it says focus plus organization equals productivity and productivity plus creativity equals flow. Can and you repeat so, that again? Yes, absolutely. Focus plus organization equals productivity. Productivity plus creativity equals flow. And so I'm always trying to get into the flow. The flow was like, that's the best place to be. Because everything mm. just happens so smooth, you know, um, it mm. just it's just smooth. It's smooth sailing. Not saying that it's not easy, you know, that it's just, you know, easy. But it's just it just there's not a whole lot of fight and struggle that you, you just do the work, you know, just do the work and it just flows through you. You know, wow. and so that's what I, that's what I aim for all, every time, you know, um, it's and I don't get that all the time. I mean, it's, it's a struggle. You know, but um, once I do get into that mode where I'm just flowing, I mean, that's how um, when I wrote my very first book, um, Make Your, Make for Your Superpower, that book flowed out of me. Did it, it really? It, it flowed. It flowed out of me. Uh, you know, and I have that as a segue. Also, I wanted yes. to talk about your books, yes. you know, especially for the people that are still on. Can you hold your book up? Yes, yes, yes. Please. So um, this book, this is um, Make For Your Superpower. Um, it's available on Amazon. You can get it there. And before the end of the segment today, I would love to be able to give a free copy of this to someone. So we'll talk a little bit more about that later. But this is Make For Your Superpower. And then the other book, 
um, this book right here. This is my The Textures, The Black, uh, History and Art of Black Hair. So this is the book that's in uh, partnership with the exhibition that's at Kent State University right now. Oh. Yeah, I love it. That website is amazing. Thank you. Oh my God. So how, speaking of your book, what was the spark when that flow started, when you actually put pen to paper and said, Ooh. I'm going to do this? You know, um, the interesting thing, we're talking about fear now, right? So the interesting thing, I knew that I always was supposed to be an entrepreneur, Ursula, um, it was just something that um, I knew was ingrained in me, but I was always too afraid to do it. Mm -hmm. And so the first time that I stepped out and actually started a business, I started with a partner. And my partner and I, we worked together for about maybe a year and a half, you know, coming up with concepts of things that we wanted to do in the business. And then our, our business partnership dissolved. Okay. And I'm telling you, that was probably one of the absolute best things that ever happened to me, because like I said, once I realized that I really didn't need a partner, you know, like I started doing this work. Mm -hmm. And as I was doing the work, I was like, I don't really need a partner. And then the partnership dissolved because I had prayed about that. I was like, God, I really, you know, this is not, you know, I, I had these other things I was like thinking that I wanted to do. And I was like, what well, I, you know, I committed myself to this. I'm going to see this through or whatever. And then it, the partnership dissolved. And that was like, God was like, you better get busy now. You know, I, I'm, I've been waiting on you all of this time. You better get busy. And as soon as that partnership dissolved, I started, that flow just started. The heavy meditation. So I used to go in the closet, in the bedroom, in the dark, in the pitch black and meditate. Yes, ma'am. In the closet, honey. In the closet. <laughs> you were not playing with mm -mm, it. Mm -mm. Well, because life isn't perfect. Absolutely not. Can you give a suggestion on what you did when you had a block and just something to motivate our listeners and myself? You know, sometimes we do hit these these mental roadblocks or emotional roadblocks or the imposter mm. syndrome roadblocks. What could you suggest so that we can maneuver our way around that or make it a little easier? Oh, I got a good one for you. Mm. So um, I, uh, at, in August, um, I decided this past August, I decided that it was time for me to step away from academia um, to pursue my business full time. So I am no longer an employee at Kent State University um, because I wanted to do my business full time. And in, in, in the preparation and doing that, um, I ended up having to end my marriage because oh. um, my partner was not on board uh, with me doing that. And so that was something that um, was very difficult. You know, I have two children, two little right. boys. And to have to break that up was difficult, you know, mm. and after after I got the divorce and everything, I had several months where I could not focus. Um, I just I couldn't focus because I was just so distracted with everything else that was going on. I was depressed. Wow. You know, I had other things happening that I just I mean, it was just a mess. And I really felt like, I'm like, well, what am I doing? Like, you know, I, I decided that this is what I wanted, you know, and now I'm living, I'm in this space now, you know, I, you know, I need to, I need to get busy, you know? Mm -hmm. And when I realized I was like, okay, this is what I've been called to do. Mm -hmm. Am I going to let spirit down? Am mm -hmm. I going to let myself down? And that's how I was able to start getting through it. I mean, and I have an amazing group of friends. Um, that's actually how I met Gunter Man. Um, mm -hmm. He and I belong to uh, Speakers Academy, uh, the um, Next Level Speakers Academy. Right. And I got with that group and met a whole bunch of other amazing people. And we all encourage each other all the time. And so I've picked up another family. And yes. yeah, you know, I picked up another family. And yeah. so 
they have really been, uh, you know, encouraging. And then I have, you know, other friends that, um, that have just been speaking life into me, people that I don't even know. Um, there was this one woman um, who came to visit uh, Textures. She came to visit Textures. I was given a tour. Mm-hmm. And she just started speaking life into me. She said, you mm-hmm. are, she, she was like, you are an amazing woman. And I see that God has something special for you to do. And I just looked at her and I just started crying. I said, I needed mm-hmm. to hear that. I needed to hear that because I've been having a hard time. You know, one of the things that helped me was just being able to know that I was being divinely guided. I couldn't see it at first. I couldn't see that I was being divinely guided at first. <sighs> When I when I decided to leave Kent, um, my last couple of weeks, I started packing up my office because when I left, I was actually um, serving as assistant dean um, for Kent State. And which, which is really interesting about that is because remember now, I'm the woman who started in the position as a professor and I had to file that affirmative action you know, complaint against the school for people like they didn't want me to be there. And now because I'm the assistant dean, they have to do what I tell them to do. How about that? I God just is, chills on my God, God is something, right? <laughs> God is something. And so I, I decided to walk away from a six figure salary as assistant dean to pursue my dreams of speaking around the world and empowering people. And so I started packing up my office. And I started bringing boxes back to my place. And this this place that I'm living at now was the place that I moved to after I got divorced. Right. And so um, I was by this time had been living here for about six months and I was bringing boxes into the house and I put one of the boxes down so that I can unlock the door. And I live on a really beautiful old street. It's all brick, brick, a brick road. A street and all the um, but the, the where I live at my my sidewalk is lined in bricks, and um, I never noticed this brick before, you know, since I had been living there for about six months, and so I put my box down on the ground and went to unlock my door, and something just said to me, "Go look to the left," and I looked to the left and I saw a brick and it had a number on it, and I didn't pay any other attention to it. I was like, okay. I brought the next box and then Spirit was like, look again. And I looked at the brick again and it had my birth year. (gasps) That's not a coincidence, you know. It's not, it's not, it's how I knew I was divinely guided here. I almost did not pick this place where I'm living because uh, my ex-husband, my ex-husband's friends live right across the street from me. Jesus. Yeah. And so I was like, I don't know if I want to live across the street from his friends, you know, but God was like, this is the place. This is where I want you to be, you know, enough room for you and the children and, you know, a wonderful spot. And I I love the street, you know, and I said, okay, okay, I'm just going to go. This is where I'm going to go. And when I first moved in, it was winter time. And so the, the ground was snow covered. So I didn't get a chance to see that brick when I was first moving in. Oh, wow. So Dr. it was, Tamika, that's it was amazing. snow covered. It was snow covered. So when I even picked the place, I didn't see the whole ground because I, I picked it out like um, in January and then I moved in in February. So it was snow covered on the ground. Wow. I never, ever noticed that brick until... I was bringing those boxes in from leaving Kent State University and I saw my birth year on that brick and I just, I just broke down and started crying. I was going to ask you, how did that make you feel? Oh but my there God. You go. Every day now, when I pass that brick, I put my foot on it and I just say, thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. I have yes. to just trust and, you know, being divinely guided takes a lot of trust. Mm, a and lot faith. Of, yes. And that's where the fearlessness comes in is that trust. Like, okay, I know that the universe is holding me. I know mm. that I'm being held, you know, and that's where, that's where the, the fearlessness comes from. I mean, if I didn't have the universe, I don't know what the heck I'll be doing, right. you know, but because I'm d- being divinely guided, that's where that, that courageousness, you know, in me comes from, you know? May I read a comment? Yeah, yeah. From blind guy and his wife. She said she meant undeserving, not underdeserving. Uh, <laughs> but either way, yes. Dr. Tamika is the truth. 
Thanks for speaking life into us tonight. Giving us what you've been given is a gift. Mm. Mm. That's, that's all I want to do. That's all I want to do is to empower people. That's all I want to do. So what can you speak more on the first generation? Yes, yes, yes. So I am actually the first person in my family to go to college. So first generation students are individuals that are first in their family to go to college and get a degree. So I'm the first and I'm still the only person in my immediate family uh, to go and get a college degree. Mm -hmm. And going to school as a first gen student is so challenging because you don't have the support system that other students have. You know, mm -hmm. students that have had parents that have gone to college or they have other family members that they can talk to who have gone to college and they can help guide you through. You know, mm -hmm. first gen students are going through this thing blind, you know, and they're, they're learning as they go. Right. Um, and when I was a student, there were so many things I didn't know. Um, but one of the things that that I think um, really motivated me to want to do this kind of work is because the things that I lacked and the things that I didn't know is what I want to give to the people that I serve. Mm -hmm. um, when I when I finished college, I didn't know how to interview for jobs, mm -hmm. um, putting a resume and everything together. I barely knew how to do that. Um, and then when I got on the job, my first couple of, you know, career jobs, I didn't even know that I had the, the, I, that I could even, um, you know, negotiate my salary. I didn't learn that I had the capability to negotiate my salary until I was well into my thirties mm -hmm. until I realized that. And I'm like, you know what? These young people need to know this because right. most, when, when first gen students graduate like there's a small number first of all of first gen students that even graduate from college so they'll go but they did won't finish because there's lots of other things they deal with financial struggles they may be taking care of a person at home maybe they have a family member they a lot of first gen students have children you know so mm -hmm. there's a lot of barriers that first gen students you know have and a lot of them don't graduate but then those that do graduate and go into the workforce typically they make about 11 percent less than really? People, yes. About 11% less than people who are non first gen. Again, like I said, because they don't understand that they, they have the power to negotiate their salary. They don't know that, you know, they are right. just, and, and a lot of first gen students, they come from low income backgrounds. About 50% of first generation students come from low income backgrounds. And so when they get a job and they see like my first job, I think I was making maybe like 35,000 a year, you know, right. and as a first gen student, I'm like, oh my God, like this is a lot of money, you mm. know, when in all actuality, the person next to me might've been making 40,000. Wow. You see what I'm saying? And I'm thinking that, okay, I got something here with this 35,000, you know, because I grew up poor. This is the most money I've ever seen. In my right. Life. You so know? we just go with it. We just go with it. And that's how they get caught up. That's how first gen students get left behind because they don't know what they don't know. So where do you find the students? So the students, since I've been working at the university, you know, um, I have had my hand with working with first gen students for a long, long time. I'm actually an alum from a program called Upward Bound. Um, up, yes. Yes. So, yeah, yeah, I so that. When yes. I'm back home where I'm from. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. Upward Bound is a government funded program under the um, TRIO programs umbrella. And so one of the ways that I was able to even start the process of working with first gen students is Kent State University every year will bring Upward Bound students on campus and they get to stay for about five weeks. And I started teaching a fashion class for those high school students. Uh, and so that's how I started working with first gen students. Yes. And I, I did that for probably about almost almost 10 years. Um, I taught a fashion class for Upper Bound and it was my way of being able to give back, you know, to those young know. people. And I, I just have a, this, this love for first gen students. I have an absolute love for them. And that's mm -hmm. how I, you know, got started with 
wanting to service them. I mean, I have a love for all students, but my heart, my heart is first gen. Mm, yes. You are God's angel, Dr. Tamika. You're about to make me cry, <laughs> Ursula. <laughs> so sweet thank you yeah um it's so needed it is so needed and then especially with young brothers and sisters that look like us so there's yeah. already that relatability yeah yes yeah. you are god's melanated angel <laughs> I'm about to put a hashtag i'm god's melanated angel yeah absolutely speaking about melanated angels up oh, first, you all listening, make sure stay tuned in. Do not leave this stream because Dr. Tamika is giving away a copy of her book. Can you lift the book up again? Yes, so I can. So we can take a screenshot yes. of it. Sorry, the light is so bright. Make feel your superpower. That's just your spirit coming out. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's you. <laughs> But I'm definitely going to put a link, the Amazon link to your yes. book in the yes. show description notes okay. as well as on the audio podcast version as well. So you all stay, stay tuned in because she's going to give the book away. Mm -hmm. but I'm going to need y'all in the stream when she does it. Yeah. So yeah, let's talk about textures. Yes. Yes. Textures is my drop the mic project. Yes, yes the, 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 the drop the mic. Um, Textures is a project that I've been working on for over four years now. Um, I started out my research career as a professor doing work about black hair. So I've always had uh, um, a desire to understand, to better understand the discrimination, the struggle that black women have uh, with hair, because I mean, as a black woman with kinky hair, I've always had issue, you know, with the fact that I didn't have quote unquote good hair and the way that society saw me um, was a little bit different than, you know, I wasn't considered as attractive as everyone else mm -hmm. who had light skin and long hair. And we're, and we're still, you know, dealing with that colorism and that what I call texturism. We're still dealing with that, you know, but um, black hair, you know, was something that I've been studying. I've been studying black hair now for almost 20 years. And wow. because I'm a creative, I wanted to have a creative way to educate other people about black hair because not everybody's going to go and pick up an academic journal and read an academic journal. Not everybody's going to pick up an academic book and read that. But people, right. will, but people will go to a museum and take a look at, you know, a, an exhibition and, and learn that way. And so that's how Textures came about from all the work that I had been doing. And um, I had a partner, I have a partner that I did it with. So my co-curator, his name is Dr. Joseph Underwood, and he's an African art historian. Mm -hmm. And um, when I met him, I told him what the project was. I was like, look, this is what I've been thinking about doing for years now. And he jumped right on it and he and I started working and, you know, getting this thing, you know, curated and here we are today. Yeah. Amazing. One of my favorite pictures is the Sonia Clark with the black hair flag. Yes. <laughs> yes. And if you all want to know what I'm talking about, it's not a secret. Just click on the link that I dropped in the show right now in the comment section and you can click on it and you can see the website that is directly linked to the textures exhibition that Dr. Tamika is talking about. Yeah. And when you were talking about it on Gunterman's show, again, as if my fire could not be ignited <laughs> even more. I'm like, this sister is the truth. I love everything about you. Oh, wow. you are so sweet, Ursula. Oh yeah. my gosh. Yeah. Um, what's the feedback you've been getting from Textures? Oh gosh, it's been nothing but a blessing. I'm absolutely telling. I mean, we've gotten so much press. Um, you know, Channel 5 News have have come, Channel 3 News came, uh, Channel 19 News came. We were just on PBS. Um, I just found out today that uh, Spectrum News uh, wants to come and interview us. So they're going to be coming next week uh, to Textures to interview wow. us there. Um, so we've gotten so much 
amazing publicity. And uh, uh, one of the biggest pieces of publicity that we just got was um, Bloomberg uh, Publishing. Do you know Bloomberg Publishing? Yes. So Bloomberg came to Textures and they have put Textures and myself and Dr. Joseph Underwood, they put us in a documentary that they're producing. So the documentary will drop next month. And it's a documentary about uh, the great artist, uh, Shawnee Crow. Do you guys know Shawnee Crow? You know Shawnee Crow? I do not. Okay, so, so, so Shawnee Crow is the braid artist who did Solange's hair when, remember, she had gone, Solange had gone to some award show and she had this big, beautiful halo braid like on her head. Big, yes. big, big halo. Okay, so Shawnee Crow was the person that did that hairstyle for her. And so Shawnee Crow is, like I said, a braid artist. She's a, a conceptual artist. She's an entrepreneur. And so Bloomberg is actually doing a documentary about Shawnee Crow. Wow. And they found out about textures and they wanted us to be in the documentary. That is amazing. Yes! Like I said, they will never forget Tamika Ellington. They will never forget me. I know it. Yes. Wow. Yes. How did it make you feel when you heard from them? I mean, said, I was just like, you know, it's been more than Dr. Joseph and I could have imagined. Um, we've been so blessed to get the pieces. I mean, some the pieces that we've gotten, um, we have ancient Egyptian pieces in our show. Pieces yeah. from ancient Egypt. I was looking at some of the pictures. I'm like, where did, how do they get these pieces, these beautiful pieces? But yeah, um, yeah, yeah. We were we collaborated with several lenders across the country, even uh, across the world, because um, we have several pieces that are from the Caribbean. We have a couple pieces that are like straight from Africa. Um, one of the biggest pieces in our show is by an artist, Mary Sabande, who is South African. So. Her um, sculptural piece came to us all the way from South Africa. You are kidding so, me. Um, not, yeah. So, so it's, what, it's been, honey, it's been it's been everything. It has been everything. I, I see. It's been popping yeah. over there. Yeah. Yes. What's one of your favorite artifacts? Oh, my gosh. If you could take one piece home right now, mm. right next to your mint plant. Ooh. You know what? Okay, if I was gonna take a piece home, there's a piece that I would take home by an artist. His name is Woodrow Nash. Uh, Woodrow Nash is a sculptor and he does these amazing bust sculptures. So from the shoulders up of these beautiful black people with these elaborate, beautiful hairstyles. Um, the piece that we have in the show is a woman who has a short crop dreadlock hairstyle and she has on an amazing copper necklace and these big, beautiful copper earrings and um, all these beautiful, like big, like um, clay beads that he uh, that he designed on the piece. I mean, it's just it's beautiful. So when one of my very first art pieces that I'm going to buy is going to be from Woodrow Nash. And the good thing is, is that Woodrow Nash is actually local. So he lives very close to where I live. And really? So, yes. Yes. So that'll be one of the first pieces um, that I purchased. But one of the things that we were the most amazed about the fact that we were able to get is a piece from uh, Kande Wiley. Do you know Kande Wiley? No. So Kande Wiley is the artist that did the portrait of Obama. Oh, really? Yes, yes. So that beautiful portrait of Obama with all the beautiful greenery and everything in the background, right? right. So we were able to get a Kende Wiley piece in our show. And oh my gosh, it was in this when it came, it was the very last thing that came when we got everything shipped. It was the very last thing that came. And so the museum called us up and was like, the Kende Wiley just showed up. You guys should come over here and see it. So Dr. Joseph and I were going to be meeting over at the museum. And when I got in there, I saw that he hadn't gotten there yet. And so I looked over and I saw the piece and I hurried up and I turned around. I said, OK, I do not want to experience Kende Wiley without Dr. Joseph. Oh, and so wow. as soon as he came, he and I just went over and we just ogled at it. Oh. I mean, it's just it's just unbelievably amazing. And Kende Wiley's pieces are like million dollar pieces. So wow. for us to be able to have something like that in the museum is just amazing. It is amazing. It is truly, truly amazing. Well, 
here's the million dollar question. When are you all coming to Atlanta? <laughs> you know what? A lot of people have been asking us about the show traveling, but it needs to happen. But it is not going to because it's so ex it's so expensive. Um, the sh yeah, the show is going to be up almost for a whole year, so that is actually atypical. Usually, museum exhibitions only stay open for maybe maybe two or three months, um, but because this show was staying open for a whole year almost we had to get the lenders to agree to allow us to lend these things for a whole year. So that's a long time for oh. those pieces to be gone. You know, so um, once the show is over, everything has to go back um, to where it came from. And uh, it was very expensive, like to, to put the show together, Dr. Joseph and I, along with our museum team, we were able to raise about a hundred thousand dollars uh really yeah. yeah so that's what we used uh, all and all we used every single stitch of stitch of money every wow. single stitch of money went into producing this show and it's just it's expensive and then plus remember now i am no longer an employee at kent state university so now i'm on to other things so like i said this was my drop the mic and that's it i'm done you done done, I'm done. i am done Blind guy and his wife said, they commented, wow, such an accomplishment on this museum experience. I'm looking at the link. Yes. That I, dropped. yes. I told you. Yes. I told you. you are, it is amazing. Whenever you get a chance, I, don't, I haven't been on their website in a while, but if you look up uh, the Hammond's house in Atlanta. Ooh. Yes. Okay. So when I first heard you on Gunterman show, and you were talking about textures, I immediately <laughs> thought about the Hammond, the Hammond House. house. Mm. Yes, it's in historic Western Atlanta. And they have a bunch of art of beautiful artifacts from the African diaspora. Okay. And paintings, you name it. They have it in there. And it's in this uh, historic house. Mm. But it's a museum. But is it downtown Atlanta, like close to Georgia State? Is that, a, a, a little further down, but yes, it is. I think I saw it and I really want, because I was in Atlanta several years ago and I walked by it and it was closed. And I didn't get a chance to go in. Do you remember yeah. what it looked like on the outside? Um, It was a, it looked like a big house, like a big yeah, brick, that's like it. a big brick house. Yeah. That's the Hammond's house. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I walked right by it and I was like, man, I want to go in there. Cause it said on the outside African-American museum. That's yes, it. yes, yes. And I wasn't able to go. So, but yeah, yeah. That's it. You know what? Speaking, oh, I just had a light bulb moment. Okay. I'll make this quick cause we'll start wrapping it up. Cause yes. I want someone to get that book. Yes. Speaking about <laughs> facing your fears. Let me tell you how fear took a stranglehold over my throat, literally. <laughs> mm. So years ago, I, again, back to the Hammond's house, I was so impressed by it. I forgot the name, what they call it, but a docent. And I applied to yeah. be one. Yes, yes, yes. And when they said I had to speak out words to everyone and explain the artifacts and the more they're explaining to me what in detail the, mm -hmm. me being a docent would be mm -hmm. my throat started locking like fear was wow. the hand and it literally shut my voice off and, and if anyone from the Hammond's house <laughs> are listening <laughs> I am so sorry I just at the time <laughs> I could, no, no, no. Let me reframe my mindset. I could do it. I chose not to. I let the fear take my voice. Well, look at you now. And you know what's amazing? I actually used to be the same way as you. Um, really? Absolutely. I hated talking in front of people. I just didn't have the confidence, you know, to do it. And I remember the very first time I spoke in front of a group, uh, one of my old professors from Kent State, Melanie Carico, I still remember her. She invited to come back and talk to the class about my experience working in the fashion industry. Mm -hmm. Ursula, that was the worst talk I ever did in my life. I stuttered and and mumbled and you sweat. Oh, oh you my gosh, that? it was um, it was horrible. It was absolutely horrible. And I was like, I will never do that again. And here I am today, now talking in front of 
you know, hundreds of people, thousands of people. The, it don't even matter now. It's like, it's, it's, as long as I have this voice, I need to bless people. And um, for a long time, I was like you too. I could not do it. Right. Yeah. Okay. Someone just asked, um, can you tell us the name of the museum in Atlanta? Again, I'll have to go. Yes, Miss Little Bit EW. Oh, I think I know who that is. <laughs> I'm going to drop the link right now. And Dr. Tamika, you can take a look at it as okay. well when you go back. Okay. So I just dropped the link and you can see the house. And what it is inside. So yeah, um, I'm glad you can relate. But you know, as you were talking, because you've been motivating me, I just had a light bulb moment that the reason why I believe both of us and other people we do not like to uh, talk or have public speaking because we were speaking someone else's story. Mm, right? Wow! Wow! Yeah. Wow. Wow. You know, um, I, I have a totally different profession, but I, I know it very well, but I, I don't care about it. This comes natural. I mean, I still have to amp myself up, but it's my story. Mm. You're talking, you're speaking your speech. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Look, we just literally talk for an hour plus Yeah, because it's something that we have our passion and purpose. In. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, before we wrap it up, let's give away a book. Yes, yes. So uh, when you all want to connect with me, um, you can go to Dr. Tamika Ellington on LinkedIn and IG. Um, if you have Facebook, you can connect with me on Facebook at Tamika Ellington PhD on Facebook. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Tamika Ellington on LinkedIn and IG. And then Tamika Ellington, PhD on Facebook. And so the very first listener that goes on my IG and DMs me their address, that's the person that's going to get the book. Oh, so, go, yeah. so, go on, so go on my IG. Make sure, make sure you follow me. Yes. Follow me, follow me on IG. Wait, man, tell, they, let them follow you first. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. So follow me on IG and make sure that you put your address in my DM. And the first person that puts their address in my DM, that'll be the person that'll get sent the book. Oh, that's amazing. Hold on, Dr. Tamika. I'm yeah. gonna drop your Instagram right now okay. in the comments. Okay. So when they follow you. <laughs> Then they can DM you. There we go. So for the listeners, you can click right on the link and it takes you directly to Dr. Tamika's Instagram and um, her website and textures, all of that. Hey, uh, young, rich, skinny. He said, hey, queens. <laughs> <laughs> That guy was funny last night, real funny. <laughs> so yeah, um, I'm excited to see who's going to win. Yes, for people coming in right now, Dr. Timmy. Oh, hold the book up, Dr. Timmy. Yes, we have yes, to see yes, it again. yes, yes. So make for your superpower. Yes, and it's also on Amazon. But let's yes, see who's going to win it. And yes, would yes, you it mind is. whoever does win if you can tag me? I if sure the person will. is okay with that. Yes, sure. I sure will. Yes, I yeah, sure will. Yeah. I would love that. And um also um hopefully things will change and you all can tour with textures. I know what you <laughs> said, but you know, you've been manifesting everything else that's been going on. I mm. can see that happening. But you know what? None of this would have happened if you if you didn't follow your purpose and mm -hmm. your passion and you put in your notice at Amber Crombie and Fitch yep, yep. and look where we are. Yeah. 2021. And you know what, what, when you just said that just a moment ago, it just reminded me when I first started on the journey of doing research about black hair, um, one of my mentors who is, she's like one of the very first scholars, black scholars ever in, 
the field of apparel and textile design. She was one of the top researchers, but one of the first black researchers, right? So I told her that I wanted to study black hair and she advised me against it because mm. she, she said, Tamika, this is when I first started my tenure and promotion um, journey. She said, Tamika, I want you to choose a different topic because I want you to get tenure and promotion. If you study black hair, I'm afraid that you won't get it because the, the topics that we care about are not valued in this um, field. That and is so, just... Ain't that deep? That's deep. She told me, she was looking out for me. Like I said, she came out, like she started researching, like I think back in the 60s or 70s. Right. And she was telling me, she said, you know, the work, and, and now, you know, since she, after she got tenure promotion, she said, Tamika, wait until after you get tenure promotion and then start studying black hair. I am so happy that I did not listen to her. Mm. You know, and I love her and I respect her. I mean, she's been an amazing mentor over the years, but something in my spirit said, nah, mm -mm, you can't do that. Whatever it is that you're going to work on, you have to be passionate about it. You can't just be doing any kind of topic that's going to be able to relate to your colleagues. You need to do something that you're passionate about. And so I did it anyway. And it, and it turned out to be the best thing that I could have ever done. Respectfully, I'm going to ask this question. It makes me wonder if she was not malicious with it at all, but speaking out of fear of her own. Yes, that's what it was. She yeah, was okay because she knew she had already experienced the discrimination, already experienced the racism. You know, okay. she had she experienced she had that experience firsthand. And she said, Tamika, I do not want you to go and do this because you're not going to get to your promotion. They do not value the work that we do. <laughs> this is a testament on how strong. Black women, our hair, black yes. people, our hair. Yes. Is it that much of a threat? Mm. You're doing a talk about hair that everyone has. Yeah. Oh my God. It's just hair. But yeah. it's powerful hair. It is. It our is. hair defies gravity. Let me Absolutely. Look at your hair now. <laughs> it looks like a hair. <laughs> Whoa, come on. <laughs> So um, our parting, oh, I could talk to you all night. Yes. I, yeah. I I'm really, going gonna, gonna to connect with you after this because I have some questions for you. Yes. So, so yes. after the live, just yes. stay on, okay? Okay. Okay. Yeah, I, I would love to. So um, yeah, anything else you'd like to promote? Any upcoming events? Let's Let's let the people hear it. Yeah, so um, Textures, if you all are interested in seeing Textures, is at the Kent State University Museum, and it'll be open until August of 2022. So you have some time to plan your trip to come to Ohio to take a look at Textures. Again, uh, the Textures book, this is the Textures book. Beautiful, beautiful book. Look at it that. Has, Can you hold it up again? Yes, so yes. People, if you're, when you're watching, take a screenshot of this. Yeah, so the book, the cover is artwork by an artist named Tawny Chapman. And um, the back of the book is artwork by a gentleman by the name of Andrew Asebu. And so the book is a compilation of essays by myself and other um, people that study black hair. But inside the book is imagery of all of the pieces that are in the show. So if you, um, mm. yeah, it's, so it's it's an amazing book. We have beautiful, beautiful work from, um, oh, look at these two pieces. Aren't they beautiful? Oh, wow. Photography. Yes. Hector Habisis is the, um, is the photographer. And this this one um, is the Malai, is the Malai or Maasai warrior. That's Maasai warrior. And this the lady um, on the other side, that's the Fulani woman. Oh, I have some Fulani earrings. Yes, yes. So but you know, may I say something real quick? Yeah. With the Maasai. Yes. I. You know who could be a direct descendant? Looking at that picture. Who? Lisa Leslie, the basketball player. Look at her Ooh. face and oh, her, then look her at cheekbones. Yes. 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 And um, I didn't mean to cut you off. It's just when oh, yeah, I saw yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, It looked like her, didn't it? 
It really I didn't even think about that. Yes, it did. Yeah. Blind guy and his wife said, Dr. Tamika, thank you in advance <laughs> for the book. Okay. <laughs> I was the first to DM you on Instagram. Okay. I would like to know where we can get an autograph textures book. You know, this sister is all about supporting a blind guy and his wife in their life, all about supporting black businesses. And they have their own talk show. Oh, nice. Yeah, you so, definitely need to subscribe yeah. to them. Yeah, so what you can do is I can autograph um, a copy, call up to the Kent State University Museum, let them know that you were in touch with me, uh, tell them that you are looking to get an autograph copy. So they'll let me know that, like, you know, just charge the book on your on the account. They'll let me know that the book was purchased. I'll go up to the museum, I'll autograph it, and then they'll send it out to you. That is so beautiful. Yeah. That's beautiful. Yeah. Any uh, parting words? Yeah. Also, too, um, again, you know, check out Make For Your Superpower on um, Amazon. And then I am going to be opening up coaching services very soon. And so I am going to be looking to take 10 clients. So if uh, you or someone you know is looking for a coach, um, let me know and, you know, get in touch with me. But look out for it. I'm going to be um, announcing that real soon. What don't you do? <laughs> what don't you do? <laughs> you know, I'm learning. This this is a process. You know, I'm telling you, it's being being an entrepreneur is so different than being an employee. You know, mm. the thing the hardest thing for me to do was to get my bank accounts set up correctly so that mm. I can begin to get the money and then be able to pay myself. It just, it took forever Did to it get really? yeah. Like, I mean, I'm still now in the process of trying to set up all my systems and everything. It takes a long time, you know, to get that stuff in right. order. And it's, it's been difficult. It really, I'm, I'm like I said, I'm learning as I'm going. So mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. That's beautiful. You, you're learning as you're going along. Mm -hmm. So for us coming it rearing the back, you know, you, you help us out. You, your first generation, I should say. Yes. It's just, I love how you don't keep everything to yourself. It's not contained. It's and very you know fluid. What? It's, and it's so important that we share because you block your blessings when you try to hold it all. And that's something that I don't understand. Um, there's a lot of people, a lot of, even our, our community, you know, that don't like to share when they know, mm -hmm. when they know things, they don't want to share. Um, they, because they feel like somebody's going to take something away again. That's another, that's another version of fear, another version of fear. And when you are willing to just give, um, you know, that shows that you, you have nothing but trust in the universe. So, right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, one last comment. Blind guy and his wife said, beautiful. Thank you again, Dr. Tamika, for the details on how to get the autograph copy. I appreciate your willingness to go to the museum to do so. Okay, perfect. I'll look mm. forward to it. They'll, I'm, as soon as you get, um, as soon as you purchase it, the museum will give me a call and I'll go sign it for you and they'll send it out. Amazing. Yes. Well, we are going to wrap it up. And everyone, thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you, Dr. Tamika, for yes. all your insight, your motivation, your fuel, um, showing us how to conquer our fears and face it um, and face it, face it with strength mm -hmm. and grace and grace and grace and grace. And Absolutely. Grace. Yes. Uh, make sure and check out all the links that I put in the show description notes and be sure to check out my website, black girls, getting their shift together dot com. Make sure you tune in because I have three more shows before I go on hiatus because your girl is going to practice some self care mm -hmm. unapologetically. Mm -hmm. But I will return January 2022. But we all have to make sure we stay refreshed so we won't get refreshed in 2022. We're mm. on it. So we yes. can be popping like Dr. Tamika. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Dr. Tamika, stay on. You all have a good night. Thank you.
of the queen, sisters manifesting their dreams. Get your cream by any means and being with self esteem. Beauty supreme and booty walk so mean. The way you fit in them jeans, you eat your cornbread and greens. Dance or a doctor, red wine or vodka. Redesign your spot and redefine your mantra. Retwist your locks and realign your chakras. Doing your squats and getting closer to God, huh? Brunching with your squad or taking a girl's trip. Adjust your crown, you guys give to the world, sis. Celestial body, drink your water. Meditate, sun kiss goddess, heavenly order. Levitate, tribe of Ashanti, black girl magic, 